A Story of a Country That Got Isakai'd. Chapter 48, Bloody Cardonian Seas. Written by Carl D. Great. Day 8, 7 a.m. The large imperial fleet are still determined to reach the Cardonian homeland. Yesterday alone, they have lost half of their ships from the combined Cardonian naval and air attacks. Just last night surgical air strikes from the F-16s, and accurate naval gunfire from the navy ships have decreased the overall morale of the sailors of the whole fleet. Cold sweat runs down on the fleet command at Sardra. They have experienced the pure might of the Cardonian navy. He is nervous on what the Cardonians would throw at them next. He is now beginning to doubt that they would be even able to see the Cardonian coast. Due to last night's attack, the fleet of Admiral Skander are catching up to them. On the way, they've picked hundreds of downed sailors from imminent death. The Cardonian Coast Guard would eventually rescue them, but any rescue operation in an active battlefield would be dangerous. Within an hour, the two fleets have rendezvous, forming a giant 600 ships fleet. An overwhelming number, and they are a day away from the Cardonian coast, they expect that Cardonian attacks would be fiercer than before. An entirely different ominous sound then was heard. Then 14 loud and slow aircrafts, entirely different from the loud and fast flying swords, began to fly above them. Those are propellers. It's an attack. Admiral Skander shouted. A what sir? An officer asked. Propellers. How? How do they have it? Those are Delaslan's secret weapon. Those giant rotating object at the nose. Exclaimed the admiral, this then shocked the officers and sailors with him on the bridge. He was referring to the 14 Super Tucano aircraft of 23rd Light Attack Squadron, the Hornets and just like the Hornets, they came buzzing in, although at full combat load, they are still maneuverable enough. Sailors began to aim their guns at the approaching enemy. At this point, the close air support aircrafts began to dive. Under their wings are, 500 pounds dumb bombs, the air force would run out of PGMs before they successfully sink the entire Imperial fleet. The Imperial guns acting as flak cannons and aircrafts dive bombing. It was a scene straight out of World War II. They then unleashed their first wave of attacks. Primarily designed as a close air support aircraft, the pilots were trained to hit tanks and other fixed targets, not moving ships. The whizzing sound of bombs filled the air for a second. Then. Explosions rippled ship after ship. Large column of water emerges as some of the bombs miss their targets. Eight steamships were critically damaged and are beginning to sink, with others lightly damaged. The planes then turned around and performed another attack run. The planes are equipped with four 500 pounds bombs under their wings, each at run, they would designate two of the bombs for a single target, ensuring accurate hits. And the second attack were more precise, hitting 11 ships. But they were not finished just yet. On their way back to base, they lined up against the ships and asterisk ratatatatata asterisk. Two FN Herstal 50. Cal machine guns attached on their wings and a large 20mm gun pod under their center fuselage simultaneously fired at the steamships. The strafing run left dozens dead and a number of ships damaged. The cannon fire were not enough to sink the ships. But it is effective in instilling terror in the hearts and minds of Imperial sailors. After that, another wave of F-16s pummeled the ships. This time, the last remaining armored cruisers of Admiral Skander were targeted. The 101st and 102nd Fighter Squadron has dedicated all of its combined 50 aircraft to the fight. They came in waves of 10 every hour. And every hour 20 to 30 ships go up in flames. And by 1 p.m. in the afternoon, 150 ships have sunk. They are at least half a day away from the Cardonian coast. The Navy was called in to use their missile batteries. The officials intended to limit the use of missiles as they are of course much more expensive to procure and produce than guided bombs. But with the Air Force running low in PGMs they were left with no choice. P-3s and E-99 EWAC aircrafts monitor the massive battle as it unfolds. But it's more like a massive target practice than a battle, as there is no semblance whatsoever of a battle. From the air, the clear blue seas provide a clear medium for TGE streaking missiles. Dozens of missiles fired from the coastal batteries painted the whole seas with white streaks. 
a photograph from one of the P-3 aircraft showing the missile skimming just above the water, would later become an icon. It is the symbol of how tough Cardonian defenses are and its resolve as a country to keep invaders at bay. The image would then circulate from history books, wherein for the first time in the history of this world, a country was able to defend itself against a large fleet without using its own navy. The Imperial fleet lies defenseless against the sea-skimming Lancer missiles, the already traumatized sailors watch the missiles hit their targets. Explosions echoed throughout the entire fleet. Loud enough that there are reports that the explosions were able to be heard from the Cardonian coast. They quickly found their targets. One of which, is the flagship of Admiral Skander. He was killed when the missile hit their ship, setting the magazines alight. Asterisk kaboom asterisk. The second in command, Commander Tsadra also perished from the massive missile strike. Along with the remaining low-ranking officers and commanders and hundreds of sailors, perished. It is also the largest missile firing the Cardonians have ever executed. Three batteries of the truck-based Lancer coastal anti-ship missiles were involved. Without leadership and almost all of their warships destroyed. The 200 remaining ships of the Empire began to rout. This is all that what is left of the Grand Fleet. 800 ships were either sunk or scuttled throughout the engagement. Using magic communicators, the Cardonians warned the surviving ships, they are to turn around at once, they would be given enough time to rescue their comrades on the water and the Cardonians would let them retreat peacefully. In which all of the remaining ships voluntarily abide. What's left of the fleet are primarily transports, supply ships and a few gunboats, they do not have the capacity to engage even a contemporary adversary. And furthermore, the sailors couldn't take it anymore, thus even though they would be disobeying the emperor's order, they threw that thought away. Even though they could be sentenced to their deaths because of disobedience, they would rather see their family one more time, rather than dying alone in the cold seas. It was also a good news for the Cardonians, as they literally ran out of PGMs and anti-ship missiles. If they continued on, they would resort using dumb bombs, they still have guided artillery rounds and tanks waiting in ambush at the beaches north of the capital city of Esden. Furthermore the Cardonians prefer to save the sailors from unnecessary death. Before the sun sets, the remaining Imperial ships set sailed, back towards their own country. The ships are overloaded with sailors rescued from the sunken ships. Early next day, the Cardonian Coast Guard then conducted a much thorough rescue operation, together with dozens of fishing trawlers. They fished out hundreds more Imperial sailors. They were then held at prison camps in Arkesia wherein they are treated as prisoners of war. They were treated nicely by the combined Archesian and Cardonian guards, they were interrogated from time to time for information. The battle costs a great toll from between the two sides. The empire would probably take another decade or so before she can re-establish such a large navy. In the Cardonian side, their guided munitions are almost depleted, even the bombs allocated for the Ginyanaean campaign were used, as such, the air force would only be able to conduct limited airstrikes on the northern islands. Cardonia can produce their own guided munitions, but at the current production capability, it would take at least two to three months before they could replenish their stocks. A new guideline was also set, the Air Force and Navy would then stock up on munition at least more than double of the current standards. The battle have also basically destroyed the Imperial Navy, the Northern Seas would be ruled by the Cardonian Navy for years to come. This was quickly reported to the regent, he was satisfied with the result, it is costly but with complete domination of the seas, there would be no naval threat that could hamper the campaign on the northern islands. Cardonia could easily ship in men, supplies and equipment with much more ease. The empire would have no way to reinforce their troops on the island. For the regent, everything is going well, they now ruled the seas surrounding Cardonia and Northern Ireland and the campaign is going nicely, with only two Cardonians dead. The naval battle resulted in many different nations recognizing Cardonia as a superpower, capable enough to go toe-in-toe -toe with powerful centrals. They would also earn more respect from the Azalians, wherein they are even finally sending a large delegation to Cardonia. The next bloody battle is brewing overland as the large imperial force marches steadily towards the besieged town of Grave.